Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome from London for wherever you may be tuning in to listen to this event. My name is Spiros Economides, and I'm an Associate Professor in International Relations and European Politics uh, at the London School of Economics. And I'll be chairing uh, today's event, which has the title, David Mitrani, Romania and the Search for a New European Order, Lessons for Today. This is an event which is co-hosted by um, LSE Ideas, which is the LSE's foreign policy think tank, and the RATU Forum, which plays a big role in sponsoring some of the activities of ideas relating to Southeastern Europe. Why have we chosen the subject of David uh, Mitrani uh, for today's event? Well, there are a number of reasons. First and foremost, uh, which I think most of you will be familiar with, is that David Mitrani was uh, a, a theorist of both uh, regional and global significance. Uh, he was a man who uh, wrote about primarily um, uh, the, the, the idea of functionalism, which has implications for the uh, develop, uh, development of the European Union, European integration, but he also wrote about uh, his idea of functionalism in a global context. He, of course, was also a, a Romanian, and his work was of great significance, not only to the country of Romania, but to Southeastern Europe more broadly, and to what we know today as the Western Balkans. So for that primary reason, we thought uh, the uh, subject matter is one of great significance. Equally important, of course, is that David Mitrani was a student of the London School of Economics. So we had to obviously put that out there to ensure that the LSE gets a good plug uh, in this uh, process. And for me personally, it's important to note that uh, in my quite lengthy career at the LSE, I've spent quite a lot of time teaching our students, both in the context of courses on European and international institutions, and also in various courses on Southeastern Europe and the Western Balkans about the significance of David Mitrani's work in the evolution of integration and the evolution of the Balkan international system. So to help us navigate our way through some of the issues relating to Mitrani's global thought and perhaps his regional uh, implications as well, I'd like to welcome our two speakers uh, this afternoon. First to speak will be uh, Professor Michael Cox. Uh, professor Cox is a founding director of Ideas and he's also a Professor Emeritus in the Inter International Relations Department at the London School of Economics. And he will be speaking about uh, David Mitrani in the context of international relations and international thought, something which he's published on before. And following on from Michael, we'll have uh, Professor Lucian Ashworth, who is a professor in political science at the Memorial University of Newfoundland, and who's also written extensively about Mitrani, both in a regional and an international context. I couldn't think of two better people to introduce us uh, to the subject of David, David Mitrani and his international thought. If you are going to engage in social media, could I just uh, remind you the hashtag for this event is at LSC Mitrani. And if you wish to tweet, it's at LSC Ideas. Uh, this event is being recorded. It's going to be made into a podcast. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Professor Michael Cox to share, share his views on the implications of David Mitrani's thought on international relations. Mick. Okay, well, uh, uh, Spiros, thank you very much. And uh, I'll say something more about the LSE connection, I'm bound to, uh, in, in my brief contribution and towards the end. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you to all those who have helped make this meeting today possible, including, of course, the RATU Forum and all of our friends down in Romania and in, in Southeast Europe. Uh, it's wonderful that this is not only an LSE event, but it's also one that connects to a very important part of the world in which LSE, uh, LSE ideas in particular, I think, is hoping to make and have an impact and sustain that relationship which Mitrani himself uh, was very keen on creating and indeed sustaining over a very, very long and productive life. And if I could start just with a generalization, Spiros, what a life it was. You know, simply reading what he wrote uh, over his long life until his death in 1975, actually makes most of us academics, frankly, you know, pale into insignificance a little bit. Uh, I've tried to count up all of his publications, not just his books, but all of his publications, many of which actually had a very strong policy orientation, particularly on, a P on the notion of peace. And it adds up to well over 200 publications, and most of them today still read very well indeed. So let me just start with that pretty obvious uh, statement about if this is really one of the great public intellectuals of the 
20th century, as well as one of the great Romanian intellectuals of the 20th century. He stands there, it seems to me, alongside all the greats of, of 20th century uh, public thought. As you know, Spiros, I have a great interest in a man called Edward Halleck Carr, E.H. Carr. Mitrani connected with, uh, with Carr in the 1940s when they were thinking about the future of Europe during World War II. And, you know, this is just an amazing, an, an amazing individual. Let me make a couple of autobiographical uh, observations or in, intros, if you don't mind me being a little bit self-indulgent here, Spiros. When did I first meet Matrani? I never met, met him, of course, personally. I wish I had. And I'm sure I would have learned a lot at the feet of the great man. But in, in intellectual terms, I met him in a rather strange way, if I might say. Now, you're in an IR department, Spiros, here at the LSE, as I am still as emeritus but i started life as what i what we were called sovietologists i studied the soviet union many 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 years ago when it still existed um which of course it no longer does as we know and i went to an institute of soviet and east european studies in glasgow in scotland uh, as to do my graduate work and one of the very first but i walked around the library there which was not an ir library i should point out and I picked up a book off the library, absolutely true story, written by David Matrani. Matrani. I never quite knew what the correct pronunciation was. And it was called Marx Against the Peasant. And I thought, well, that's an interesting title for an interesting subject. And my goodness me, what an interesting book it was. Because Matrani, not only in that book published in 1951 and, and translated in several languages, not only kind of had a deep interest in Marx, which was really, really impressive, actually, um, but also was Marxism as such, as an, as an ideology or as a doctrine, suitable for peasant societies? And of course, much of that then, of course, related back to what had happened in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, and no doubt to his own experience within Romania. So I actually came to Matrani not through... Uh, the functional theory of politics, which he, he subsequently developed, but actually through looking at Marx, looking at the Soviet Union, what was going to happen post collectivization, what was happening in Eastern Europe. And it was actually one of the great books and had an enormous influence on my thinking uh, uh, about the applicability of Marxism, particularly in non industrial uh, society or where the majority of people were actually small peasant holders. Many years later, I was in the Department of International Politics at Aberystwyth. And I became the editor, as you know, of the journal of the British International Studies Association called Review of International Studies. One day, a manuscript arrived. This was 1998, uh, untyped by somebody called Dorothy Anderson. Uh, I didn't know Dorothy Anderson, but I got to know her quite well. And uh, it was really a short wonderful biography of David Matrani, covering the whole period of his life, of course, born 1888 in Romania and dying, of course, in 1975. And I thought, is that the same Matrani who I'd read earlier on in uh, looking at his work on Marx and the Pet? And I just couldn't believe the range of his work and the impact that that work had. And I was so proud, really, and I still remain very proud of when I was editor of, of that journal. But one of the best things, frankly, I ever did was to bring out that uh, she wasn't an academic. She was the secretary uh, to David Matrani, but a very brilliant woman and, uh, as she was, and no doubt, hopefully still is. Um, and I thought it was just a wonderful guide. And by the way, if you want the best bibliographical guide to Matrani's work, go back to look at that particular piece by Dorothy Anderson. It's a, it's a remarkable piece. And, I, and again, I say I'm, I'm really proud to have published it. It's one of the best things I ever did when I was the editor of the review, I think. The, the next stage in this, and I'll be very quick before I go on to make some general comments, uh, Spiros, is coming to the LSE in 2002 3. Here I met yet another Matrani, if I might put it like this, you know, the Matrani of IR, the Matrani I think that you probably know best, Spiros, the Matrani of the so called functional theory of politics. What was also interesting coming to the LSE, of course, was to know that people in the IR department, including yourself and others like Paul Taylor, had a deep interest in Matrani. And I think in many ways, anybody who was then interested, particularly in European integration and the origins of inter European integration, 
the origins of the European project. You might look at some of the great writers on that, like Ernie Haas and many others, uh, Stanley Hoffman, but actually one of the writers you really had to come to terms with was also David Matrani. And again, part of my own journey, intellectual journey, which I hope is still going on today, was it simply discovering another Matrani, the Matrani, the Matrani of, in a sense of the LSE, the Matrani of the functional theory of politics. And many of the people I got to know over the next few years, like uh, John Drew and a number of other great, great British academics, were really huge, huge supporters and promoters of the work of, of, of Mitrani in, in this country. And I thought one of the things I took from that, again, as Spiros, was here after all was a non-American making a major contribution to international relations. You know the old argument that's been made by, by the great Stanley Hoffman, sadly no longer with us, the great Stanley Hoffman, who said, um, uh, international relations, he said in 1977, um, has become an American social science. To which I would simply reply, David Matrani. Uh, I would also reply, Edward Halleck Carr, and a number of other writers, of course. But nonetheless, it always seems to me what's important about Matrani and why we need to go back to him, rethink him, celebrate his life, criticize some of the things he did, of course, as well, is because he is a genuine European contribution to. A Euro, to a European IR as much as a, an IR, which has for one reason or another, we know the reasons why, has become dominated by the United States. This is not to dislike the United States or my friends in American IR, but I think again, it is so important for us to think about what IR is and who writes it. And I think therefore Matrani's contribution to what I call a non-American IR is very important. It's also, my, I might add a kind of a point, it's a non-realist approach too. I mean, realism has dominated uh, IR, as we know, uh, for many years. Of course, it's now under great challenge and has been so for many, many years, I know. But nonetheless, here was a very different kind of way of thinking about the relation between states through his functional theory. And it wasn't one that was utopian. I think this is the other point I'd make about it. He was a problem solver. He tried to find a way of thinking through relations between states. And of course, much of this, as I hope Lucien will talk about, derived from his own experience in his own area, in his own region. It wasn't just about Western Europe and European integration, say, between France or Germany or the Benelux countries during World War II and after it. It was actually drawing very much from the deeply problematic relations of, of that particular Part, part of Europe as well. And, I, and Lucian, I know, is going to say a bit more than that. Uh, and the fourth, my fourth meeting, of course, with um, Mitrani, in a sense, was with the, with the Ratu Forum, um, which has done such a fantastic job in supporting our work here in LSE Ideas. And of course, it took me down to Romania, I have to say, apologetically for the first, for the very first time a year or two ago. And again, this simply stimulated me thinking more about how Romania, in a sense, situates itself in the European family, and from whom can it draw inspiration? And again, we're talking about not just Mitrani as an historical figure, but Mitrani as a figure from whom we can learn for order. And it seems to me that in that, in that, I call it that part of the world, without sounding too patronizing, but in Southeast Europe, as much as in our own part of the world, in, in, in the Western part of Europe, there's still so much we can learn from Mitrani about cooperation, how to form the basis and foundations of cooperation, which is in very short supply at the moment, is it not? And indeed, we, we've never needed Mitrani more than we need uh, Mitrani today. And not just, as I say, in, in, in Southeastern Europe, say between Romania and Hungary, which, whose relations, of course, are highly problematic, but also in our own part of the world. Now, I can't talk for too long, and I'm not going to, because I think you, there's another speaker to come, and I know there'll be a lot of questions, and I hope a lot of answers. But I want to have three takeaways. The first takeaway I have from Mitrani in that long and extraordinary life of his is um, a non-dogmatic approach to thinking about real world problems. Um, I think IR has much to recommend it. I, I'm no critic of IR, uh, but I think it's taken a very serious theoretical turn <laughs> over the last 15 years, if I can say that in the best humor. And I think one of the things that Matrani does, or Matrani does, is to kind of keep your feet on the ground a bit. Uh, 
Because what's the purpose of IR? Should it even have a purpose? Some would say it shouldn't have a purpose at all. Why should it have a purpose? It could be as theoretical as it like. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with people being as theoretical as they like and as detached from the real world as they want to be. That's fine. Um, and, and we need that. We do need that. We genuinely do need that in IR. We don't want to simply add up a lot of facts. But I think one of the wonderful things about Matrani, looking at his life, coming from where he came, coming to study in London, going back to the States, working for Unilever, you know, working in Chatham House, advising government, writing all the time. He's always looking to solve a problem. And also he's a very important example of somebody who's a great public intellectual, but not narrowly academic. And again, I've got nothing against academics. After all, I am one, and I'm probably one of the narrowest academics I know. But nonetheless, I think it's wonderful looking at that life of his. So many different careers bundled in to one life experience, both as public intellectual, as writer, as, as a brilliant academic, he did his PhD and all the rest of it. But somebody also wanted to get, in a sense, put, I put it like this, his hands dirty to try and feel there's real world problems out there. Let me try and come up with a, a genuine solution to those problems in a non-dogmatic way. And I think that's where functionalism comes from. It, 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 it's a solution to a problem, but it's one which accepts the world as a difficult place. It, it, in a sense, it's, anti it's non-utopian. And I think maybe again, Lucian and you uh, Spiros can come back on that one. I, I, again, I get back to something I've already hinted at and suggested more, is this simply the sheer range of his work. I mean, you look, he started writing in 1915 when he was living in London and, and then at the LSE, but he was also working quite closely, I think, with the British government at the time. And clearly he's looking forward to the post-war settlement uh, after the end of the First World War. Indeed, his most first important book, I suppose, is one, it's a pamphlet rather than a book written in 1917 called Greater Romania, where he's trying to make the case for the expansion and enlargement of Romania, particularly into Transylvania and beyond. But again, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it's not really the main issue. If you then go forward a few more years, there he is writing about the peasants in Romania. Then later on, he's writing about functional cooperation. Then he's working for the United Nations. Then he's at Carnegie, a man of huge energy who ranges right across. And I think the, the sheer quality as well as the quantity of his work done in many dimensions, you know, not just the narrowly defined academic, but also the policy maker who engages with the policy world, with the business world and many, many, many others design. I, I think the, the third thing I'd say, and this is almost my last comment, and then I'll pass over to, to Lucian. Uh, David Mitrani belongs to the world, but he's also Romanian. I know that's a a pretty obvious thing to say, but I think there's something seriously international <laughs> about David Matrani. But there's also something quintessentially Romanian about his roots and his origins and how much he wrote derived from his own study and understanding of, 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 of Romania. Uh, I've already mentioned the book he did called Greater Romania, which is more pamphlet really than book. Later on in the 1930s, he wrote Land and Peasant in Romania, which I think actually derived from his PhD thesis. Perhaps Lucian could say something about that. And then, of course, his Marx versus Peasant book in 51, although it's not just based on Romania, has, has the roots within a Romanian experience. Last but by no means least, and to come back to the point you made at the very beginning, Spiros, I'm sure David Machani would have done many things that he was going to do and would have done it without the LSE, but I'm very pleased that he first came to the LSE in 1912 where he studied under the great sociologist Hobhouse and the great political theorist here, uh, Graham, Graham Wallace. He wrote many of his early works here at the LSC, about which I'm very, very happy. It's totally appropriate, of course, we're debating Mitrani today from the LSC. Uh, and I'd also point out to those who want to do any more research on David Mitrani, you'll find a large amount of his papers in the LSC archives here today. And I know a few of you out there listening have almost certainly consulted those. So again, thank you very much for this opportunity to share my own brief thought about a very great man indeed. Thank you. Mick, thank you very much. And thank you for covering so much ground, uh, which gives rise to all sorts of avenues to explore later on. Uh, let me hand over now to Lucian, who's going to pick up some of the threads of your comments and add to them. Lucian. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, that was great, Mick. Uh, and actually, I mean, covering 
coming back to some of those points from a different direction uh, um, and what I want to say here too. But let me first start off with a story. Um, uh, many of you may or may not know Charles Pentland. Uh, he was uh, one of the, the major figures in the study of European integration uh, in Canada. Uh, and during the 60s and 70s, uh, David Matrani would frequent um, North American conferences. Oh, one IR scholar in the US uh, said that he looked like a, uh, quote, um, Old Testament prophet. And it was at one of these meetings that uh, a very young Charles Pentland, uh, he's retired now, he's an emeritus professor, uh, but uh, the young, a young Charles Pentland met David Matrani. Uh, and he, Pentland was a, a PhD student uh, at that time. And uh, he, he met Matrani, who was this great uh, a figure in the study of European integration. And David Matrani asked Charles Pentland, so what are you studying for your PhD? And Pentland replied, European integration theory, to which David Matrani looked at him and said, why are you studying Europe? It's not about Europe, it's about the world. Uh, and why integration? Um, integration isn't important. What's important is peace and, 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 and preventing war. Uh, and theory. Uh, you know, don't get lost on this theory stuff. You know, just, just go out and do it. Uh, so that was it. You know, Charles Pentland, three words summarizing his PhD, uh, just destroyed by the great man. Uh, but anyway, some of those themes I'll come back to. Yet despite his uh, reaction to Pentland there on the importance of Europe, of course, Matrani was uh, deeply involved in Europe. Uh, he was involved in 1928, for example, in an attempt uh, to bridge the gap between Eastern European socialist parties and uh, peasant parties uh, that, uh, that he tried to get James Ramsay MacDonald and the Labour Party in, in, in Prague, uh, they were at Prague at the time, uh, to do. That failed. Um, and uh, he um, also, uh, at one point, uh, um, and I haven't been able to find the um, the origin of the story, but it appears in Skidelsky's book on uh, on uh, Keynes. At one point, uh, Matrani did try to convince both Keynes and the Romanian government to make Keynes uh, the finance minister of Romania. And there's a what if, uh, a, a historical what if we could all play around with. Uh, and staying with Romania, he was of course considered initially a, a Romanian expert. Uh, uh, Mix mentioned uh, the uh, Greater Romania piece. Uh, in fact, his first two major publications were on Romania. Uh, in the First World War, he also published in Romanian, in Romanian newspapers. Uh, he was presented the Allied case to, to Romanians when Romania was still neutral, and he presented the Romanian case to, to, the, uh, to the Allies. Uh, so he acted as a kind of a go-between. And then after the, uh, the, the war, he, he was heavily involved in the Balkans. Uh, he traveled around the Balkans uh, as a correspondent for the Manchester Guardian, uh, armed only with his small browning pistol. Uh, and in fact, when he retired from the Manchester Guardian to go on and work for the Carnegie Foundation, uh, the, uh, the famous uh, uh, Scott, the famous um, editor of the Manchester Guardian, who was a great friend of Matrani's, said that uh, uh, the Guardian's foreign policy during that time was Matrani's foreign policy, uh, that he was in, in, very, very influential. Now, during his life, uh, Matrani would always stress the kind of the UK, US, the sort of the, the Anglo uh, origins of the functional approach, uh, and that's certainly to a certain a certain extent that's true. Um, he gets a lot of the ideas for the functional approach from from L. T. Hobhouse, uh, from Graham Wallace, but, but particularly Hobhouse, uh, from Mary Parker Follett uh, in the United States and Guild Socialism, and uh, perhaps these are cousins, but also H. G. Wells uh, has references to functionalism in his 1920s novels as well. Um, but um, what I want to argue um, in, the, in this short presentation is that um, uh, he came to his particular view of the functional approach through his experience of Southeast Europe and particularly Romania. Um, and um, part of this is um, his um, his view of the primacy of need. According to a story from James Patrick Sewell, this had a hell of a lot to do with Matrani 
um, going through starvation uh, uh, as a child. Matrani uh, had a, a quick candid discussion with Sewell at the Bellagio conference in 1969 on this issue. Matrani really wasn't a person who talked about his past or his private life a hell of a lot. Um, he's also um, uh, really quite pessimistic about what can be achieved, which is why uh, and there's no rational path uh, uh, to, uh, to global governance, which is why, of course, he falls back on the functional approach, because he doesn't think that there's a, a future for things like federalism. Uh, uh, he sees these as far too uh, utopian. And this comes back to Mick's issue, uh, a point about him being pragmatic. But I think there were six lessons that Matrani drew uh, from his study of Southeastern Europe, and they're contained in his book on war government in Southeast Europe. Um, and uh, his book on the peasants, um, peasant in Romania and his discussion of the peasant social revolution uh, in Southeast Europe, but in Romania in particular. Uh, the first of these six uh, is the collapse of the private public dichotomy. This is very important for Matrani. What he took, and actually this comes from Nibor too, I mean talking about sort of differences with classical realism, there's actually lots of crossovers as well with classical realism. Uh, and Nibor is concerned about this kind of issue of private property. What fascinated Matrani was that in war governments, particularly in southeastern Europe, was the way that you could maintain private ownership of property, but property organized for public utility. And this also came out uh, in, um, uh, in peasant agriculture too, that um, uh, peasants uh, owned uh, agriculture that had resulted from the social re peasant social revolution had kept uh, the ownership of land in private hands, but uh, it served a social purpose, and particularly also a generational purpose. Uh, that um, uh, in uh, the peasant attachment to the land was also a generational one. You you uh, you uh, took it from from the from past generations and you held it in trust for future. And for those of you with some experience of um, of, of rural Ireland, uh, I'm thinking here particularly of John B. Keane's uh, um, The Field, um, his play uh, and also film. Um, this sort of idea of so the social utility privately owned uh, is also present in sort of Irish conceptions. So that's the first one. Uh, the second is um, the uh, support for planning, but, out, but outside of formal state structures. And here again, he took war government in Southeast Asia. It was largely functional, or at least the bits that survived and the bits that worked were functional. Um, and, uh, the, um, uh, and increasingly for him, the importance of the success of the economic side of war government, even as the military and political side failed. The third was the... Um, the issue that different spheres of life work under different logics. And this, Mick has already mentioned in reference to uh, Marx against the peasant, uh, that you couldn't apply capitalism and Marxism, which was urban and industrial, to, uh, to agriculture. Uh, and uh, again, he gets this from analyzing the peasant, particularly peasants in Romania, and the fact that you could not apply um, uh, uh, things like, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, industrial practices and industrial scales of production. In fact, agriculture required much more sort of low level uh, uh, levels of organization to be efficient. Um, so different spheres of life work under different logics, hence the importance of dividing government up into functional organizations. Uh, fourth is parasitic national elites, uh, which he experienced directly uh, in Romania, uh, uh, particularly uh, after the First World War, where urban elites uh, uh, tried to work against the interests of peasants. Uh, and he saw this as, a, a, again, as a major problem of the state system, but also also that this parasitic nature increases when the social life bursts the bounds of the state. Fifth, the importance of grassroots knowledge and democracy. Here there's an element where he shares, to a certain extent, um, issues with someone else att uh, attached to the LSE, uh, um, Friedrich von Hayek. Uh, Hayek's concept of the catalaxy of the market was about releasing knowledge that was held uh, at, at grassroots level. Well, the same 
thing occurs to Matrani, uh, that there's this uh, knowledge that's held by people in a function. Uh, and this grassroots knowledge needs to come out. And for that, you need functionally organized democracy. So instead of going for the market, as Hayek did, Matrani went for the idea of functional organizations as another way of uh, tapping into this. And here we see the influence quite strongly of uh, Proudhon as well, uh, uh, and the anarchists. And there is a strong anarchist element to Matrani. I mean, it doesn't go as far as wanting to get rid of the state, but uh, uh, there's anarchist elements, particularly Proudhon elements here. And then finally, number six, uh, the issue of the controlling of the sinews of war. And again, his experience of the way that um, states centralized in Southeast Europe uh, made him realize that even quite conservative and inefficient states could actually do a, a good job of organizing effectively for war. Uh, so one of the ways he saw a backdoor way of preventing future wars was to remove the ability of states to organize the sinews of war. And this, of course, is why he was so supportive of the European coal and steel community uh, after the Second World War, this idea that uh, you would prevent total war from being able to, to happen uh, again. So those, I think, are the six things that he drew. Um, from uh, Southeast Europe and particularly from his experience in Romania. Um, and uh, I suppose just by in summary, what are, the important thing here is a lot of people who studied Europe would talk about how the, um, Mitrani, uh, and you see this in compilations sometimes, they say that, uh, um, that it's Mitrani is about economic integration, not political integration. He has no theory of the state. Uh, and that is a complete and utter nonsense. And in fact, Mitrani is fundamentally a political scientist. This is a theory of government that he's putting forward. But it's not a theory of state government. And that's an crucial thing. And this comes back again to his readings of Proudhon and of the peasant experience. Um, and I'd like to just l l stress on that uh, um, as well. Uh, the pessimism here. He's pragmatic but pessimistic. Uh, he's not a utopian thinker. Uh, the the reason why he rejects uh, federalism, international federalism, isn't because he thinks it's wrong, uh, it's because he thinks it's utopian. Um, uh, and he sees the functional process as the, uh, as the on only one that's really going to get us out of the bind that we're in. Now, I want to finish off um, w uh, by making a quick reference to my 2006 article. This was meant to have been the first stage of writing an intellectual biography of Matrani. But I, I found I couldn't do it because in order to be able to write a good intellectual biography, you need to really also get a, a sense of the person, their, um, their life and times, the people around them, uh, their private life. And Matrani was very guarded about his private life. The, the mask very rarely slipped. Um, but it, um, I did manage to find two interesting things, and although it's not good enough for an intellectual biography, I think it's uh, it's good enough for um, it's uh, it's good enough for a presentation. Um, the first is um, uh, discovering in the British Library a copy of his first major book, uh, International Sanctions, uh, and in it, it obviously was a personal copy owned by the family. There's a little inscription uh, that he has to his wife, uh, Ina Leimbeer, uh the writer and painter, and in it he says. If all people, my dear Ina, this is written, this is scrawled in his hand uh, and handwriting. If all people, my dear Ina, had something of your kind nature, then sanctions would be superfluous. And instead of spending so many hours on this barbarous subject, I could have passed much more wisely in enjoying your presence. And I have just one other slightly opposite um, uh, anecdote here. Um, in 1952, uh, the International, um, International Affairs Journal uh, published a, um, uh, a review of um, uh, Georg Schwarzenberger's uh, Power Politics, written by David Mitrani. And it's a rather kind of damn with faint praise kind of review. It's very nuts and bolts. It's, it just says what's in the book. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's equivocal. It doesn't really say whether Mitrani liked it or not. Um, and then later on, I was going through the Manchester Guardian archives, and I found a letter from uh, Mitrani written to the then editor of The Guardian, who was a um, uh, personal friend of Mitrani's. And he's just talking about having finished a review for the inter international affairs on Georg Schwarzenberger's latest book, Power Politics. And in this letter, he writes, 
Georg Schwarzenberger is a slimy little Germanic worm, and I don't know who pays for or buys this kind of book. Uh, so, um, a little bit of colour that usually you don't find uh, in, uh, in Mitrani's writings. And as, as I said, um, those uh, kind of vignettes are not good enough to fill an intellectual biography, but I think it's probably um, good enough to end our, uh, a presentation uh, on Mitrani uh, uh, on those high notes. <laughs> Lucian, thank you very much, especially for that bit of colour at the end. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to a lot of these uh, points that both you and Mick have raised. Uh, before we go to the audience's and participants' questions, could I just make two or three very brief points to sum up what I think are the major issues that you've raised in both your presentations? I think first and foremost, a distinction which both of you have made is that the work of David Mitrani is not narrowly academic. It covers a wider range of area. The coverage is that of a public intellectual, somebody who's interested in, um, in, in theoretical aspects of governance, but at the same time is hands-on and wishes to see things happen in the world. There's a policy relevance here, and as Mick says, a desire to get one's hands dirty, which distinguishes Mitrani from perhaps uh, more contemporary figures in international relations who are either narrowly academic or completely yeah. Um, obsessed with the policy world and cannot do that crossover, which makes him uh, rather remarkable in his time uh, in, in this particular way. Secondly, I think a very important point which came across very strongly, and I think it's something that needs to be emphasized, is that Mitrani's central concern internationally was peace. And it was peace that he was uh, uh, after in terms of, of, of trying to write about and, and talk about, and not some narrow form of integration, uh, which I'd like to come back to later on in the form of a question. I think the third point uh, that you've both covered and made very, very clear is that his interest was in the global. I know this is a very 21st century way of saying it, but essentially what Mitrani was after was some kind of form of international governance. It wasn't based on a conception of a region, whether that was the European region or the Southeast European region. He was thinking about uh, a form of international governance, and I suspect, and Mick perhaps, or both of you can correct me if I'm wrong here, this is directly related to his experience as a person formed and shaped in the interwar period. Uh, that, you know, the, 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 the question of good governance on an international level, an international government, is something that really uh, uh, was very, very, uh, um, uh, was paramount in terms of his thinking, and it wasn't to do with regional integration or the region uh, it specifically. And last but not least, and I think uh, Lucien uh, made this very clear in his six points, is that he was deeply rooted, both intellectually and personally, in Southeastern Europe. He wrote about it, he thought about it, uh, and he went back to it uh, consistently. So these are, this is an important effect uh, on his life, it's an important effect on his thought, uh, and I think it really is something which mustn't be forgotten in terms of trying to get to grips with what this man was and, and what he produced and, and how he thought. So that's enough about summing up. Let me just go to questions now from, from our participants. And we have, I think, a very provocative and I think important question from uh, the University of Bucharest, uh, Professor Paul Dragos Aligisa, and I do apologize if I get the pronunciation, pronunciation of your name wrong. Uh, the question is, how do we explain the fact that even though Mitrani, as we've seen, has had an immense intellectual contribution, remarkable in all aspects, uh, both academically and as a public intellectual. He hasn't been sufficiently recognized as such since he passed away in 1975. Mick's answer was perhaps that the Americanization of IR theory has put a lid on Mitrani and his work, but could you please try and answer this question? Why is he yeah. not considered to be a first order thinker? Mick? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll deal with that. I, I do think the Americanization of IR the overwhelming over, over dominance, frankly, of the US voice in IR. Again, I don't criticize my American colleagues. I mean, it's all about power. And, you know, the, the more powerful will have a more more voices in the in the, in the game. I mean, that's the, that's the way it is. Uh, but I do think that is a fact. And, and you know, drawing from that, the, the, there is an issue. The issue being, the, the, does one take seriously those who are not American who contribute to IR? And I, I think, you know, the United States does suffer and I think, as indeed do all great powers, suffer from a kind of narcissism and a certain kind of parochialism. Um, in, uh, can you have a global power that is parochial? Well, I think the United States may be a good, good, good example of that. Again, I say that not because Americans don't produce good IR, but I just do two things. That's the point. I think the other thing is that is the you know, 
realism has dominated within IR, um, not just for Americans, obviously, the Chinese are pretty realist as well. Um, and, but I think, again, you know, uh, although you're right to say, Lucian, that he wasn't a utopian, in another way, he's not really a realist either. You know, he wouldn't fit into a realist discourse, and I think that also makes a, a difference as well. I'd also say one, two quick other points in answer to your question, Professor Drag. It's great to hear from you, by the way. Um, I think modern IR has actually become so uh, has become slightly theoreticized, uh, overly theoretical. Um, and now again, I don't want to go into diatribe against postmodernism and all the rest of it, but but nonetheless, I do think the kind of his whole way of thinking about the world, you know, is not one that easily fits into much of what is now going on inside a lot of social science. Let's be perfectly honest within within the West. I would, however, add a note of optimism at the end of that. I think over the last 20 years, 25 years, maybe less of the LSE, because it's always been there, we have actually seen a, a really serious engagement with the history of our subject. I mean, I've made my own contributions, you know, through E.H. Carr. Many others have done work on Morgenthau. And Lucian has done wonderful work. Peter, Peter Wilson at the at the LSE and many, many others and friends in, in around the world have done it. But I, I think it's actually, we're in a better situation today thinking about the history of our subject and the role played by such key figures. But I agree, slightly forgotten figures su such as uh, David Matron. So I think we're in a better situation today than we may have been, say, during the Cold War itself. Lucien, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I would. I, I'd just like to say, well, first of all, is that um, uh, he gets shut out of a lot of UK discourse uh, because he's shut out by the original English school. And in fact, actually, David Matrani is far more better engaged with by the classical realists in the US than he is by the original English school in the UK, which really kind of cuts him out. Uh, so there's that issue. I would say, though, uh, maybe sort of reversing this, that actually he was really big in his time. Uh, let's not forget that uh, uh, Morgenthau was a great admirer of Matrani's. He wrote the introduction to the 1966 uh, uh, American edition of a working peace six system, uh, and between the 1950s and 1960s, he was kind of a big, a big figure. Uh, but the irony is perhaps that he was actually, and I, you know, I, I would agree with Mick uh, uh, um, to a certain degree that the kind of the sort of uh, the Americanization of IR does kind of cut out a lot of non-American figures, but actually during the 1950s and 1970s, he was actually very popular in the States, mm -hmm. probably more than he was in Britain. And what I'd say is he's become a minor figure. He wasn't a minor figure, but he became a minor figure when transatlantic international relations, based mostly in the US, uh, rewrote itself in the 1980s and 1990s. And Matrani didn't kind of fit into mm. the new kind of inter-paradigm debate view of international relations. So mm. it's, it's really a retroactive cutting out. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move on to another question, which is uh, also of, of great interest uh, from Tyler Bergman. I think Tyler Bergman is a student of yours, Lucien, at least he's your new <laughs> Yes, he is. <laughs> His question is, is an interesting one, because what Tyler is asking is, um, to what extent would you would you agree or disagree that perhaps Mitrani uh, has got the wrong end of the stick, or at least hasn't got the whole stick, uh, because he tends to neglect what happens within states. A lot of the focus is on peace uh, as a result of trying to figure out how states interact, you know, international relations uh, on at that, that end of the spectrum. And what perhaps is missing from, from his analysis uh, uh, of, of the international system is what happens within states, how decisions are made and the consequences of those decisions. Uh, Lucien, would you like to, to have a stab at that? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I suppose, I think you can get that um, sense uh, if you kind of read his international relations material uh, and you kind of read him through international theory. So, I mean, it, it is a very good question. Um, the only thing I think is that when you actually sort of um, look at his wider work, uh, uh, you know, and, and Mick was talking about this, you know, his work on things like the Ombudsman, I mean, he's one of the early advocates of introducing the idea of the Ombudsman in the English speaking world. Uh, you know, his work on, uh, um, on, on you know, Marx against the peasant, uh, his work on, uh, on war government. Uh, there is actually a lot more domestic politics uh, mm -hmm. material that uh, that um, he's 
uh, talking about. Uh, so there, there is actually an engagement with uh, with domestic politics in in Mitrani, and uh, it does actually come out in some of his international work. Think about the way that examples of real existing functionalism that he talks about in a working peace system include things like London transport. Uh, it's the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, it's uh, a lot of stuff actually from domestic politics and his work on the welfare state as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't intervene in a relationship that you have with your student there, uh, <laughs> uh, Lucy. No, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. And in a sense, that could also be a more general critique of quite a lot of IR, that it, deal, it deals with how states like billiard balls hit one another rather than what's going on inside. And I, I think that's a more general critique of certain kinds of international relations. Of course, we've tried to resolve that by kind of going into the in, inside the box rather than just thinking of it as a black box. Foreign policy analysis tries to do this. And indeed, uh, certain forms of realism have moved, in a sense, into, into the state, into the society, to see that there's not a, a, a Chinese wall separating the domestic from the from from the external but i think it's a, it is a very good question but I'd, I'd more direct that point towards a lot of ir in general uh, just towards matrani in particular but as Lucy has said i think you know if you read matrani in the totality there's an enormous amount of work that is looking at domestic society and no more so than actually looking at romania which is really quite fascinating could I just ask a general question perhaps make you may want to have a go at, at, mm -hmm. at helping me out here mm -hmm. uh, I, like you, have been in the world of teaching international relations and writing about international relations for quite some time now. Yeah. And sometimes okay. I really do wonder whether we fall foul of the accusation of trying to appropriate thinkers uh, into the sort of <laughs> narrow world of international relations when we shouldn't do so. We should use their thought and quote them and, and analyze them, but then not necessarily say, well, they are international relationists or belong yeah. to the world by our theory. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And, and that's why I gave my little autobiographical feel at the moment rather, rather it's not, it wasn't just an ego trip although i'm sure it was it was also to demonstrate where i've come from and in, in fact, i started with soviet studies and um, which was not ir in fact very not ir it was really about how Mitrani was thinking about marx marx's theory it's a lot of marx's theory and they're very interesting and how he's thinking about how marxism could ever apply to a peasant society. But I also make that point that some of the great contributions to IR, we call it IR, has been made by people who had never never had to take degrees in IR because there weren't degrees in IR until the 1950s and the 1960s. You think E.H. Carr, he was a classicist who then worked in the Foreign Office, you know, who then did a lot of work through Chatham House. You think of a number of other, H.J. Morgenstern, what he wrote didn't come from the classroom, it didn't come from theory, it came from his experiences, you know, as a, as, as a Jewish German, getting out of Germany, thinking of fascism, what fascism meant for Europe, for him, his family, and the whole generation of Jewish people, and then translating much of that in, into IR. And in a way, much of American IR, which we call American IR, actually <coughs> derives from the tragedy of the European experience and many European thinkers who make a big contribution to that, but not in, the, in that narrowly academic way. I think the worry for me today, and it gets back to the original question I think asked by my colleague from Bucharest, is we, we've narrowed down too much as academics, I think. I think we have narrowed down too much. As, and I understand the professional pressures to do so, but I really would want to see much more engagement of academics in the policy world, in the business world, in the world of trade unions, it doesn't really matter. Getting your hands dirty and bringing that experience back in, into what your teaching is. I think it makes you a better researcher and will certainly make you a more credible teacher. Mm. Lucian? Yeah, and uh, I'm uh, reminded of that in a story from uh, uh, Andrew Williams from St. Andrews, uh, who was, of course, trained as a historian, not as an IR expert. And he recounts, uh, again, as a story about how IR kind of appropriates thinkers and then kind of uh, um, doesn't necessarily notice that, they, <laughs> that there's a, a hell of a lot of their thought under the waterline that is not IR. Uh, he was at an interview and he, and he was asked uh, about his... Um, uh, whether he knew uh, certain IR writers and say, have you read E.H. Carr? To which Andrew said, yes, I have. <laughs> 
In fact, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but I've read the whole of his history of the Soviet Union. And it's like, and they, they looked around at each other, and it was quite clear that he'd read the wrong car. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, um, but also I think, you know, just um, uh, uh, coming back to Mick's point there, I think that's one of the reasons for the richness of uh, interwar uh, international thought and international relations. Uh, and it comes back to uh, Spiros' point about the kind of Matrani, this sort of, this global uh, um, uh, 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 view of him, which is also common with a lot of the other kind of public intellectuals emerging at the time, uh, is the extent to which they're polymaths and the richness of international thought. And in fact, in some respects, and it's an argument I've made in some publications, that the 1950s, in many respects, with uh, the move to the university, is a narrowing of international thought. There's a lot that we lose uh, mm -hmm. when international relations goes from being a much more freewheeling uh, um, uh, open field to being a university discipline. Mm. I agree entirely Thank with you. that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let me take two questions uh, together because we are rapidly running out of time and I'd like to accommodate as many people as possible and these are very important questions and they both come from Romania. The first is uh, from uh, by Radu Albukomanescu who's in the Faculty of European Studies at the University of Cluj mm. um, and his, well, his initial comment is one which laments the a relative lack of knowledge about Mitrani in Romania today. Uh, and then his question is, do you think that the structural differences Mitrani noticed between state building in Central and Eastern Europe, which focuses on high politics, etc., etc., and the governance applied in the British and American models of society, which have to do with low politics, welfare, and living standards, had any significant impact on his functionalist thought? That's the first question. So it's to do with mm. high politics, low politics, a different conception of politics, perhaps, in the post-war period in other parts of Europe and in the Anglo Anglosphere, if you want. The second question comes from Nikolai Ratsiu, uh, uh, who obviously is involved in the, uh, the event itself, uh, uh, diagonally as it were. And he writes, I discovered in my father, Ion Ratsiu's correspondence with David Mitrani, the sentence that, and I quote, my conclusion is a single idea, an international formula which does not offend the natural attachment and attractions of nationality, nor links of religion and race. And the question, and here's the, uh, the sting in the tail, if you want, the question is, please comment when considering the state of the EU today. <laughs> so we have two slightly different questions, but wow. uh, Lucian, can I turn to you first? And if you'd like to address either of those questions or both of them, I'm happy to repeat well, them. But, uh, no, no, I, I got them all. Thank you, Nikolai, and, and thank you for our <laughs> other colleague. They're two fantastic <laughs> questions. And again, thanks to Nikolai and, and the refu and to Pamela and, and all our friends down there. Um, the lack of knowledge is an interesting one. I'll just briefly mention that. You know, obviously, our Romanian colleagues and friends know much more about that than I do. If there is a lack of knowledge, well, this is part of the, I hope this is part of a process by which he can be, re, you know, brought back in mm. to the, into, into the conversation within, within Romania. Uh, now, why he would have been forgotten, maybe had a long, maybe a large part to do with the long communist period between the end of the Second World War and 1989, I, I couldn't imagine the Ceausescus were terribly enthusiastic about thinking about uh, Mitrani. Um, and, and maybe it's taken more time within universities in Romania to to realize uh, Mitrani's importance. I, but I do know, by the way, and here's, a, here's a, uh, my friend from the University of Bucharest who asked the first question. I know that there is now a, a big uh, Mitrani uh, uh, program being developed down there, and I hope it works very well in the University of Bucharest and hope in association with our colleagues up in Cluj. But that's an interesting way. I think the problem is that quite often we forget greats. We quite often forget. I mean, he died in 1975. He died in the middle of the Cold War. You could say there were more important things going on. I don't know. But if, if he has been forgotten, that's a bad thing. Uh, and I think, you know, it's high time then that he comes back into that discussion. And also very important, and I say this as somebody who's not an expert of Romania, but has tried to learn as much about the country historically as possible. I've just written a fairly long piece on the Trianon Conference or the Treaty of June 1920, which is the most difficult thing I've ever had to write. <laughs> I, I felt like I was walking on eggs. But nonetheless, again, you, you could you can see why it's quite difficult because it, there is, let's be perfectly honest, within a lot of countries now in Central East Europe, as there's been running, a kind of nationalist, a, a nationalist un, un, undertone to much of the debate. My country right or wrong, if I might put it like that. And, 
and I don't want to I don't want to sound too liberal, you know, or too outside this and unctuous, but I think Bernie actually does transcend nationalism. We've talked about his Romanian roots, the importance of Romania, but he's trying to do something much more. And I think that is why I think he's so important now for the whole of Southeastern Europe and also for Romania as well. Because it, it tells everybody in Romania, and again, I don't mean this to sound preachy, as somebody, you know, who has much to teach, not just people in Romania, but people outside about the, the importance of cooperation. I get that, however, that gets to that point of Nikolai Ratius. Thanks again for that, Nikolai. The word natural attachment, I think, is so important there. I think what, and this really gets to the heart of what I think, you say, look, people are going to have an attachment to a country. They are going to have an attachment to a particular religion or faith. And this is certainly true in the history of Central and Southeastern Europe, as, as we well know, after the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 19, 1918. And he's saying you've got to start there rather than challenge it. And that's so important. He starts with the reality. And he then says, how can we move to bring that um, into into play in such a way that we don't have to challenge the person for being a Romanian or a Hungarian or whatever. We've got to start there and then think of ways that we can work together, you know, if you like, very practically to see ways in which we can uh, not overcome the differences, but in a way build on those to take us forward to levels of cooperation. And of course, that brings us a little bit back to John Maynard Keynes, who was mentioned earlier on, because Keynes and others in 1920 did have a conception of a Danubian economic federation. If you remember Keynes in his great book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, which I'll plug, I, I had the great privilege <laughs> to write an introduction for last year, but in that he does call for a Danubian economic federation. So I can actually see why somebody would say, can't we get Keynes down here to become the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the finance minister? I'll, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Lucien pick up on anything I've missed out, but thanks for those questions. Yeah. Lucien. Lucien, Lucien you're, the final word is yours. You've got a number okay. that you may want to cover. Pick and choose whatever you want. And we'll Ab with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll try and cover both. Uh, um, sort of lack of knowledge in Romania, why he might not be there. Well, I think one of the big issues, I think, is that Matrani did go over to, to writing in English for a North Atlantic audience. I mean, he was very much the Atlanticist. But I think it's also another thing. I, uh, the, I often tease my students here in Canada by bringing up Lord Beaverbrook and telling them he's the most famous Canadian ever uh, to blank stares because they don't know who he is, or introducing Raymond Massey and saying the greatest Canadian actor ever, and none of them know who he is. Uh, uh, and, you know, these were two very big people in their day who walked the world stage in different different ways but are unknown and I think you know in some respects that can just be a kind of a, a cultural moment and all countries have them of kind of, uh, of of forgetting people from their past who are then often rediscovered and then people don't even really re remember that they were ever forgotten. Um, in terms of um, yeah, the, the issue of uh, uniting things by, uh, by bringing people together by what unites them I think is central to Matrani and that I think is something that uh, really underscores what I say is his, you know, he's pessimistic. He's, there's a lowering of sights with the uh, functional approach. Uh, he's saying you know we, we can we really have to start uh, very, very simply by bringing people together only by uh, what unites them or what they're willing uh, to do. So there, there is a kind of a pessimism here and a kind of uh, a, a pragmatism. I mean, that led Innes Claude uh, to uh, view the functional approach, which he covers quite a lot in uh, Swords into Plowshares and has a lot of good things to say. But he is critical of it, of, of, of being relatively weak beer when you come up against major issues like the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, so there, there is an issue. How would I uh, look at it at the EU today? Well, perhaps the EU today is um, a, a classic example there of, uh, of Matrani's point, his pessimism about uh, the problems of trying to bring everyone together all at the same time uh, on issues that people find uh, uh, um, uh, very, very dis d divisive. So it's uh, maybe ending by uh, stressing that, uh, that, that pessimism uh, and pragmatism that exists in Matrani's thought. Right. Thank you, Lucien. Now, I, I do have a number of more questions, but we have run out of time. So I think uh, I'm going to leave those for the time being. And I do apologize to those who have put questions which haven't been answered. Uh, let me, if I could, just conclude by thanking LSE Ideas for putting on and promoting this really interesting subject, which 
uh, I think both Lucian and Mick have done uh, uh, marvels in trying to promote uh, and explain the, the, the contemporary relevance of this thinker. Of course, I'd like to also thank on behalf of LSE Ideas and everybody involved uh, in this meeting, the Ratio Forum and the Ratio Foundation for their support. Uh, inevitably, my thanks also go out to the participants who've asked questions, who've listened, who perhaps hopefully have, have learned and will take a greater interest in the work of David Mitrani. And I would ask them, if possible, to fill out a short survey which may appear in their browser in the not too distant future, uh, commenting on the nature of this event. And last but not least, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Michael Cox and Professor Lucian Ashworth for shedding light not only on the past, uh, not only on what David Mitrani wrote about then, and how he uh, affected the world around him then, but on how he could be of greater contemporary relevance and how he could actually fit into modern discussions about what ha what's happening, not only in Europe, not only in Southeastern Europe, but the world beyond. So thank you all very much. And we look forward to seeing you very soon again at one of the LSE Ideas events. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris.